resurrexit sicut ixit, alleluia. Ora pro nobis Deum, alleluia. Gaudia letari Virgo Maria, alleluia, quia quem meruisti portari, quia surrexit domino sveri, alleluia. Oremus Deus, qui per resurrectionem fidi tui, Domini nostri Iesu Christi, mundum letificare diniatus as presta quesumus, upereus genetricem Virgine Mariae, perpetue capiamus gaudia vitae, periundum Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Amen. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for pray us, for us, for us right for to thee. Saint Francis de Sales, pray for, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That final part was when Pope Gregory the Great ended up adding that into the plague of Rome that he was around, if anybody wasn't familiar with that. Uh, Canon, welcome. Now, he's with the uh, Institute of Christ that came to Sovereign Priest, which headquarters is in Chicago, Illinois, and he is the provincial superior of them, uh, ordained by Cardinal Burke, if I'm right, right? Yes, that's right, in 2007. And Burke's a big fan of you guys, apparently. Is that correct, too? Oh, we're grateful. Uh, Cardinal Burke, when he was the Bishop of La Crosse, Wisconsin, he invited the Institute to begin serving in the United States in 1995. Um, and then when he uh, was made Archbishop of St. Louis, um, some years later, uh, he invited us to start um, in St. Louis at St. Francis de Sales Oratory in 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's ordained, um, I would say, uh, about 70 uh, of the priests of the Institute, and he's a wonderful spiritual father, and uh, we pray for him daily, and uh, he always remembers our names, which is very, uh, very impressive. He's a phenomenal memory uh, that just shows the love that he has as a, as a very paternal spiritual father. Yeah, I'm sad I, I was supposed to go down in June to meet him in Mexico, but I think that's gotten delayed, <laughs> so not, not pulling that one off, but Kenneth, can you tell us a little bit, a bit about the Institute? Yes, yeah, so the Institute was founded um, and granted canonical status in 1990. Um, our founder, uh, Monsignor Vac, uh, he was uh, ordained a priest by uh, Pope John Paul II in 1979. And he worked in Rome um, for the Congregation of Clergy uh, during the early part of the 90s while he was studying in Rome. And he was encouraged by uh, some of the, um, some of the, uh, you, you could call the, uh, the traditional Roman school of churchmen, um, and people who were um, people like Cardinal Palazzini, Cardinal Lodi, Monsignor Piolanti, who was the rector at the Lateran University, they encouraged him to found a community, a priestly community that would um, really hand on the traditional Roman formation. Um, and and so, um, by God's grace, uh, he did that in 1990. And our mother house was uh, in Florence, mm -hmm. Florence, where it still is today. Uh, but was started there in Florence, and we were welcomed by Cardinal Pivanelli and uh, the Archbishop of Florence. And the Institute was of diocesan right of Florence up until um, 2008. We were granted the pontifical right status pro tempore, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then in 2000 um, in 2016, the feast of Saint Francis de Sales, we were granted the the definitive um, and, and the long term the, the permanent status of the pontifical right. So um, our mother house is located in, in Florence, Italy, and from there uh, we serve in 12 countries around the world. And um, the Institute is really a family, so there are, there are the priests, there are of course the seminarians studying to be priests, there are also brothers, so men who receive uh, the traditional minor orders and perhaps even the subdiaconate, but they don't want to study to be priests, they want to serve. Uh, the church serves souls in the local apostolates together with the priests, alongside the priests. And then we also have sisters. Uh, so women, uh, they were, uh, the, the, the female branch was founded in the uh, in 2002. Um, so these are our, uh, our sisters who want to live a life uh, dedicated to the liturgy. They chant the divine office, mm -hmm. um, they have meditation, daily adoration, and they also uh, make vestments and other liturgical items. And they also work with female youth, teaching catechism and doing some activities for female youth, uh, things like summer camps, for example, and, and um, sometimes periodic activities throughout the year. So the Institute really forms this family. And there's also a lay people who decide to make a commitment to our spirituality. And, and um, they become members of what we call the Society of the Sacred Heart, which is, I guess, you could say the third order of the Institute, per se. Um, so it's really a, a family of souls. Um, on three continents, um, Europe and Africa and Gabon. Uh, 
Uh, Monsignor Varg served as the Vicar General of a diocese in Gabon uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s. Um, and um, when the institute was canonically erected, um, it, was con it was erected by the Bishop of Mula in Gabon. Um, and and, and uh, to this day, we have a school there now and a flourishing mission in Wheelan and other places uh, throughout the country of Gabon. And uh, here in the United States, we're serving currently in 18 dioceses. Chicago is our provincial headquarters. And then we serve coast to coast uh, from California, from the Bay Area to Connecticut um, and um, in uh, Louisiana and then all the way up in, into Wisconsin. So really kind of the four four corners there, the continental uh, of the United States. Yes, I met these guys a couple of months ago in Raleigh, and these they're fantastic. We're going to talk about a little bit of what Cannon uh, mentioned in his uh, lecture on St. Joseph and St. Francis of Sales, which will be linked below the video. You can watch the entire video under their, on their website, which you can go there and help donate to them as well. Um, Cannon, speaking of that, what why is St. Francis of Sales uh, connected with you guys? Yes. So St. Francis de Sales really has a very unique uh, method uh, to teach, to educate souls. Um, and that's why St. John Bosco, he called his order the Salesians, because he found that uh, the, the approach of St. Francis de Sales, his writings, uh, his character, his, his method is very, uh, um, very helpful in, in helping souls to learn more about God and to become devout. St. Francis de Sales really has a, a spirituality of attraction. You know, he wants to attract souls um, to Christ. Um, you know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, it's a little bit like, imagine you have a, a, you know, a young boy and his father at the dinner table. And the father's saying, look, son, you got to eat your vegetables, got to eat your spinach, you got to eat all that. And, you know, he can just, you know, you know, order the son, he can kind of beat it into his son if he has to, and the son might resist. He might not really want to do that because he doesn't like the taste, etc. But, you know, if the father seeks to attract his son mm -hmm. to the goodness of that, if he says, son, look, you know, these vegetables are good for you because it gives you nutrients. It gives you these vitamins. So you can be big and strong. And if he explains all that, if he leads by example, if he, if he eats together with his son, if he tries to attract his son to you know the goodness that these vegetables will bring to him, mm -hmm. um, that's really what St. Francis himself is trying to do um, in the spiritual life. Teach us why virtue is good for us, why God's goodness attracts us, um, he wants to show us how a holy life is a happy life mm -hmm. and how, you know, practicing the virtues like charity and goodness brings a joy and a peace which this world cannot give. So it's, um, it's a spirituality that um, it's very accessible. He says, look, you know, you don't always have the chance to do great and flamboyant actions for God. You know, not everyone is a street preacher or a missionary in Africa or a martyr giving their blood for the faith. But we all... But each one of us is called to sanctity um, by practicing what he calls little virtues. Every day we have multiple occasions of um, practicing little virtues, being faithful to the duties of our state of life in, in simple things that are right under our nose. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the chance to practice virtues like patience, uh, gratitude, um, you know, humility, uh, just um, simple little, um, little virtues like that. And by being faithful in the little things and by working in kind of concentrating our spiritual efforts on the little things, then we can learn to be faithful in the greater things if God and his providence calls us to do them later on. Yeah, I remember when you talked about lead by example with Francis, I, there was that uh, famous one when he's uh, there's a Muslim in the church looking at watching him. Or was it a Muslim? It was, it was a heretic of some sort. And they thought he was just acting. He was pretending to be pious. And then they saw him genuflect, and there was nobody in the church except he didn't even know this he was being watched and that converted him right on the spot yes he really had a, a way to attract people there was one of his uh, one of his servants in the in the house there actually will look through the keyhole of his of, uh, of the door to his his office and just to see how he would act um, when no one else was around and he really acted um, just as if he acted you know in a very reverent way in a very gentle way mm -hmm. Um, because he was always conscious that he was in the presence of God. Even when no one else was around, he always conducted himself in, in a way that, in which he truly believed that God saw him in every moment, and every one of his actions was meant to, um, you know, to please God and to, uh, 
and to and to serve God. So um, th there's a great book I really recommend that people read about St. Francis de Sales, written by an eyewitness, um, a younger bishop, uh, actually who looked up to St. Francis de Sales as a model, as a father, and how he himself should be a bishop. Hmm. And it's called The Spirit of St. Francis de Sales, and the name of the author is Jean-Pierre um, Camus, or we would say Camus in English, C-A-M-U-S, Jean-Pierre Camus. Um, the spirit of St. Francis de Sales. So you have an eyewitness who knew the saint, um, and he writes down the things that he would do and that he would say, and that he found personally very edifying for him. So I uh, really recommend, you can even find it online, uh, The Spirit of St. Francis de Sales. Great little chapters, little anecdotes, um, really, you know, very easy to read and very edifying and uplifting. Perfect. I was hoping you'd bring something out. I, the only one I've read that's kind of biographical was The Gentleman Saint. Yes, that's I, I, a good one too. Yeah, that, I thought it was great. There was a lot of laugh out louds during it. <laughs> that's um, a good one too. There's a great um, th there's a great one in French by uh, Monsignor Trochu. Uh -huh. Now, Monsignor Trochu, I know the tan prints some of uh, the biographies like the Saint Curie of Ars, Saint John Vianney, uh -huh. and perhaps others written by this uh, French author Monsignor Trochu. I don't think the fr the Saint Francis de Sales one is translated. It's a very big. It's actually two big volumes. Oh wow! But that's my that's my favorite. Um, wow. But the spirit of Saint Francis de Sales is great because anytime you can really, um, you know, read something that's written by someone who saw the saint, who knew the saint, I think it's very profound and and very very inspirational. I have to check that out. I appreciate it again. Um, saint Joseph's the virtues of Saint Joseph and Saint Francis de Sales. The lecture you gave in Raleigh, North Carolina, a couple months ago. Can you speak on the virtues that you were uh, you were you're mentioning and how they can be related to men today? Yes. Well, um, you know, I think one such virtue that really we see in Saint Joseph and that Saint Francis de Sales wrote a lot about himself as a great example of is the virtue of meekness. Mm -hmm. Meekness. Remember, Jesus said, "Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart." And you know. In, in today's world, we think that, you know, manly strength and being a man is all about kind of a very kind of um, kind of a human or horizontal understanding what strength is. You know, to be strong, you have to go out, you have to you have to attack or you kind of have to be this kind of big, big kind of muscular guy. Um, you know, we kind of almost uh, that a man is this very kind of this very kind of horizontal sort of understanding. Well, you know, St. Francis de Sales says, you know that really to be truly strong we have to be meek like Jesus and to be really meek we have to be um, gentle gentle we have to use self-control you can have all this manly strength but if you can't control it mm -hmm. then it will control you mm -hmm. right how many times um, you know anger we lash out in, um, in anger angry words destroy families and friendships um, you know, anger fl flares up and gets out of control. So St. Thomas actually, in speaking about the virtue of meekness, he says meekness restrains anger. You know, it's a type of humility that keeps our anger under control. And, um, you know, it's, um, people want to think of gentleness um, as, you know, um, as a type of weakness, but actually it's this, it's this power of self-control over passion self-control over passion um, and um, you know St. Thomas when he talks about fortitude that virtue of uh, spiritual strength he says you know the greatest act of the virtue of fortitude is not to kind of go out and to attack just kind of one fell swoop mm -hmm. he says actually the greatest act of this virtue of fortitude is to endure is to kind of stand your ground in the midst of difficulty to bear with troubles that are ongoing day after day, week after week, year after year. He says, that is really the truly strong man. That is really what fortitude um, is about. Um, you know, it takes, and it takes courage to be gentle. It takes courage not to just kind of lash out in impatience um, or just to kind of seek the easy way mm -hmm. out. Um, no, it takes, um, it takes courage. It takes patience to, you know, to listen, to look for ways to solve problems. Um, of course, it takes uh, patience to be prayerful, realizing that, you know, God has an answer for the situation I'm dealing with. Um, I have to do this God's way and not my way, but we have to listen, we have to be prayerful, we have to go to confession, 
uh, we have to uh, you know be purified spiritually um, and that way uh, we can truly um, help the situation so we need to be um, you know um, St. Francis de Sales would say there's nothing so strong as true gentleness and there's nothing so gentle as true strength it's, it's beautiful when you think about it. There's nothing so strong as true gentleness. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing, uh, there's nothing that's truly, um, and there's no gentleness like true strength. Um, so we see that really with, um, you know, with, with St. Joseph. He was um, a very meek, very meek man. And he had to be strong. He had to travel far with his family into Egypt. He had to come back. He had to constantly be adapting to God's plan for his life. Um, and he did so in a way, um, you know, that was truly uh, was truly gentle, truly meek, because it was God's will and not his own he was seeking. Um, so, you know, th there's some misconceptions about gentleness. Some people think gentleness is a type of uh, tolerance for anything and everything. Um, but, you know, if you remember, um, you know, like our Blessed Mother, who was truly gentle, she, you know, she told... You know, people at the wedding feast of Cana, do whatever my son tells you. Mm -hmm. You know, gentleness never compromises the truth, but um, but the truly gentle people, they seek to make the truth better known and better loved in its fullness by the, by the attractive manner in which the truth is presented. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to really, to be truly, um, you know, to really convert souls to Christ, we have to, you know, teach people the truth, but do it in a way that they'll understand it that it will be also attractive to them. They'll see that it's good. Mm -hmm. It's good for them. You know, like the vegetables are good uh, for the son to eat because it's, it's nourishing for him. It helps him to grow up to become a man. So um, really the manner in which we do that, you know, that's very important for parents, especially, I think. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if we teach, you know, it's very good to teach our kids the catechism. We have to do that. That's important. But you know, if we do it kind of in a way we're just kind of commanding them mm -hmm. and so on, they might react and, and take it the wrong way and go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. But we want to really to, you know, find, um, teach them in a gentle way, and in, a, in a firm way, but in a gentle way, um, you know, we have to uh, really preach by example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, teach them that, you know, to be Catholic really is to be happy um, mm -hmm. and that knowing our faith, you know, brings us a joy. Um, and if we are examples of that, if we're examples of patience, if we're examples of, you know, uh, examples, we, you know, for examples of saying we're sorry when we make mistakes as parents, we teach them, you know, how, you know, to repent of their own faults and failings. So we need to, um, you know, we really have to be examples of this gentleness as well. And actually that is truly what's, what's, what's a true strength. Yeah, you you mentioned not being doorstep. So there's a there was a story on France of Sales about somebody taking his hat and in France there was a that's a big thing. You don't do that. <laughs> he took his hat off and was like, you know, put it behind, wasn't gonna give it back. And the guy goes up to him and goes, Your your religion teaches you to turn the other cheek. This is after he slapped him. He goes, What are you gonna do? And Francis <laughs> I know what my religion says, but I don't know if I'm gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> the guy gave his hat back. <laughs> St. Francis de Sales was a great um, outdoorsman. Uh, you know, he was uh, he had the education of men of his time, so he he was very good with fencing. He loved horseback riding, um, and he had to do that sometimes. Um, when he was a young priest, he was he would do these little missionary um, kind of sallies out into a uh, territory which had become Protestant. Once was Catholic, but it was um, you know Calvin was Calvinism was rampant, and many. Many, many churches were closed. Um, the whole countryside had become Calvinist. He would go out there, but it wasn't safe for him when he would be preaching out there during the day and, and meeting with people. It wasn't safe for him to stay there. Mm -hmm. And no one could give him shelter because they were afraid. So he would have to go back to the Catholic fortress miles away and spend the night there. Um, and, um, you know, there were people actually even tried to kill him um, on that road. And he, uh, he defended himself. He defended himself there. Um, and um, there's one night too, he kind of got caught up in a tree. Uh, it was very cold, um, and the wolves had were, were, were hot on his scent. And so he went up in a tree to escape the wolves. He had to spend all night up in the tree in the middle of winter there in the mountainous region, and what's today Switzerland. 
um, and uh, there was some sympathetic presence that found him the next morning. He was quite the ice cube. Um, so he was a man that really, um, uh, you know, a man of a very strong temperament too. Mm -hmm. You know, years later, um, after his death, um, in his office, under his desk, people saw there was a there was a like a rug there, and they saw that uh, this rug was all worn away because he had this way of kind of. Um, with his feet, it was, when he would get upset, he would get impatient, he would start to kind of like, um, you know, just kind of move his feet on this rug to try to get himself under control a little bit. Um, you could see where the rug was worn away. So he was not someone who was naturally meek by, by character. Mm -hmm. He was a fiery, a fiery choleric man, but he had to learn to get control of himself. He had to learn to really, he had to learn that method of true gentleness, be convinced of it, and ask God for the grace to really be that man of true strength by being gentle, by being a father, by attracting people um, to the good, um, attracting people to the church by his mannerisms. Well, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, you know, St. Francis de Sales was, uh, he was named the, uh, uh, the Archbishop of Geneva. Uh, Geneva is in modern-day Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And uh, Geneva um, really was a Calvinist stronghold. Um, and and, the, and the, the bishop before him could not even be in Geneva because, you know, the, the Calvinists had taken over and the civil authorities of the city were Calvinist. Um, and so there were some people that said, well, now you're bishop of Geneva, you should go and you should attack. You should get your troops together, you know, get the Duke of Savoy to give you troops and go and attack and take over the city by force. It's rightfully yours. You should even be its prince, not only its bishop, its prince. So go and take it by force. And um, he was like, um, you know, people, you don't know what spirit you are. You know, he would cite in the Gospels, um, you know, the, the, the disciples when they said to our Lord, look, this city did not receive you. And, um, you know, called on fire and brimstone upon that, upon that city that, you know, didn't receive you, Lord. The Lord said, you don't know what spirit you are. He said, the Son of Man did not come to destroy souls. He came to save them. And so St. Francis Sell said, look, you want me to, you know, take on this city by, with cannon and gun and gunpowder that smells like the sulfurs of hell? Um, no, that's not the way. We're going we're gonna to take, take Geneva by the force of charity. And so what he would do over time, and he would go into the city, kind of, and he would just smile at people. Um, they would smile at them. He would attract them. He would talk to them. You know, Calvinists are not a friendly people. They're not warm people. <laughs> and he would just start to attract, and he would, you know, talk to the kids, and, and he, would, he would be, and so people had this kind of loving joy about them that people wanted to, to know what was the secret of that. Um, and so they would, they would start to listen to him. He would give them little pamphlets to read. He'd put little pamphlets under, their, uh, under the doors of their homes, trying to get them to read and to, and to learn that actually our Catholic faith is not at all dismal and drab and gray. No, rather um, it it is um, you know when you when you serve Christ, uh, when you give your life um, uh, to spirituality, that again there's a, a fruit from there's a joy and a peace, a strength that nothing else in this world can compare to. Um, and he um, he embodied that in his life, and that's how eventually um, he converted. Um, you know, well over 70,000 souls back to the Catholic faith. He died, he was only 56 or 54, 56 years old. Mm -hmm. um, he died at a, a relatively young age. Um, and, uh, but he accomplished a lot, again, by that recipe of gentleness, by attracting souls uh, to Christ. And you can read those tracts if you get the book, The Catholic Controversies. Yes, The Catholic Controversy, exactly. And also... Um, you know, controversy was a particular uh, literary genre of its time. Mm -hmm. It's written very much in the spirit of people, uh, people of the time. They they love to kind of um, uh, present questions in this way, in this kind of uh, uh, you know, as a, as a controversy. Yeah. Um, and um, he um, and and really all, all those books, you know, the book that Tan Prince is simply um, kind of a collection of these various pamphlets. They're all put together. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a wonderful wonderful read. Oh yes, great apologetic work. And he was a yes. big student of Bellarmine. I found out it was in a gentleman yes. saying he talked about he only wanted three books. His missile was bravery, and the controversies of Bellarmine. Yes, yes, he was educated by Jesuits um, in his youth. He had a Jesuit spirit, spiritual director, Father Paul Savin, for a number of years. And so uh, he was originally, 
Yes, he really had a great regard for the Jesuits of the time. St. Francis Sells lived in the years um, following the closing of the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. And he was really, um, he was very much responsible for implementing the reforms of Trent and the teaching and the practice, the discipline of the clergy um, that um, the Council of Trent mandated within his diocese, within uh, uh, the Kingdom of Savoy. So he was very, uh, very active and, um, and he loved people like St. St. Charles Borromeo as well, he looked up to, and, and other saints uh, of his time. What are some practical examples or practices one could do to become more meek, to rein in the anger? Uh, yes. Well, I think, first of all, um, it begins with, um, uh, it begins with um, going to God and saying, God, um, you know, I know I'm, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be impatient. I don't want to drive people away from me. So help me. You know, make my heart like unto thine. Mm -hmm. you know, Jesus, meek and humble of heart. Make my heart like unto thine. In the spiritual life, we have to ask for what we don't have. Mm -hmm. Ask for what you don't have and beg the Lord. Beg the Lord to give you um, the grace you need to, uh, you know, to be patient, to be gentle. Um, I also recommend, in a practical way, reading more St. Francis de Sales in his book, Introduction to the Devout Life. Um, he has little chapters on particular virtues that we all need to strive um, mm -hmm. uh, on meekness, on patience, for example. Um, and he gives some good little strategies in there. Um, and also, uh, he wrote thousands of letters of spiritual direction for people. Mm -hmm. um, and those letters have been put together in small little volumes um, that you can find um, that are easily, uh, uh, easily available out there. And he wrote to a lot of people who were choleric who had a hard time, they were, they were tough characters. It was hard for them to keep their temper under control, be they, you know, you know women or men. Mm -hmm. and, he would, um, and he would write to them, and he, would, he had a, a way, I recommend, if you read those letters, it sounds like, wow, he was like writing to me. <laughs> you know, uh, well, how did he know me so well? Well, he knows human nature well. He knows human nature well. And so he knows how to really, um, he, he knows how to teach us as a good father. So I would recommend on a practical level looking up St. Francis de Sales, um, reading in there, and um, especially Introduction to the Devout Life, um, and you'll find there are little, little things that are, that are helpful for you. Um, I think part of it is, um, you know, we, we don't often look at ourselves um, from the viewpoint of other people. Um, I think if you put yourself in someone else's shoes mm -hmm. and you say, wow, you know, if I say what I say every day, I act how I act every day, and if, you know, if I had to look at myself from the outside, well, would I be happy with myself? I mean, how would I respond? Um, you know, St. Francis de Sales would say, you have to, um, you know, if you're making a salad, you got to use a lot more olive oil uh, than vinegar. You know, use a little bit of vinegar to give it some taste, and that's it. If you put too much vinegar in, no one's going to want to eat the salad because it's just, you can't eat it anymore. And so we need a lot more olive oil uh, than vinegar in how we talk with people. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine if the words that you said every day, um, imagine if, um, you know, that was like making a salad dressing. Um, you know, well, would you want to eat at the end of the day what you dished out to others during that day? Um, so I think we need to really take a step back, make an examination of conscience, and really ask ourselves, um, you know, how do I really appear to other people? every day um, and how can I be more Christ-like and how I appear to them I guess it would be if you really want to know the truth ask your spouse <laughs> right that, that's why yeah that's why you know we have to have the humility to to take constructive criticism mm -hmm. um, and you know we have to understand so many people around us have to be patient with us don't they mm -hmm. they have to be patient with us maybe in ways we're not even aware of and so if other people can be patient with us, with our shortcomings and, and failings, et cetera, limitations, well, then why should we not be patient with other people? If God, our Father, is so patient with us, he's been forgiving us time after time, confession after confession for so many years. And even when we were, you know, we led difficult lives and when we were, he called us to conversion. He, he's been making us more holy little by little. Over the years, if God is so patient with us, well, then why can't we be patient with other people for love of God? So um, let's simply ask for that patience, ask for that meekness, you know, that we need um, every day, um, and uh, 
and we'll see in time, the more we ask, the more it'll, it'll be given to us. But we also got to be good listeners. You know, humility really begins with listening. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, even St. Paul says that, you know, faith comes from hearing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we need to be good listeners and not just hear what we want to hear, but really, you know, listen. And, you know, that's why also we have confession, because we go to confession and the priest is going to tell us things we might not like to hear or perhaps things we think we know already. But actually, if we really listen deeper, even if we have heard what he's told us already, maybe we need to apply that in a different way. So let's have the humility to be good listeners, and that's going to help us to be more meek um, and not make ourselves kind of the center, you know, be less self-reverential and really ask us and really understand what is God's will um, for us and how we should treat these people around us, and not just our way of doing it. It's much more easier to just say, everyone just listen to me. Be a, <laughs> we'll be a better place. <laughs> right. Uh, what's another virtue uh, that you touched upon in that lecture? Uh, that meekness. Uh, what would be another top, uh, the top three list? Well, St. Francis Sells also talks about simplicity. Mm-hmm. Simplicity. Um, that's a, a virtue that really we don't hear a lot about. You know, the first Vatican Council in 1870 says that God is, is simple in himself. Omnino simplex. God is, is simple. He is pure love. He's pure being. Right? So there's no complexity of parts in God. Um, and so for us, um, we tend to complicate things too much in our lives. Sometimes reality is complicated. Sometimes we're simplistic. Mm-hmm. That's not what we mean here. Um, but we need to realize that the more we serve God, the more we pray, the more we, we practice um, faith, hope, and charity in daily life, then in some ways life becomes less complex, becomes more, more simple to a certain degree. Um, and so we need to, um, uh, we need to practice that, that simple look. I mean, our Lord was born in the stable of Bethlehem, the very simple surroundings. He died upon the cross. Um, and so we need to, um, we need to, uh, look for ways, again, not to overcomplicate how we live our lives. Um, but we, we life is complicated, but we don't have to be complicated. Um, but we simply um, need to you know, look to our Lord. Um, we need to apply in our daily lives the spiritual, the spiritual means we know that are there, um, especially um, you know, confession and also um, spiritual communion during these times especially. Mm-hmm. And... By, make, by looking more at our Lord, we'll understand ourselves for who we truly are. And by looking more at him, uh, we'll see um, really how we need, don't need to make, attach so much importance to the trinkets and the toys and the, and the things of life that are really superfluous, that really hold us back, mm-hmm. those unhealthy attachments. The more we look at our Lord, the more we understand that, mm-hmm. the more we can sweep that away, um, and our life becomes more simple. Uh, we appreciate more of the simple things of life. Um, the graces God is giving us every day, the gifts that are all around us. Um, but we have to look more on our Lord and less on ourselves in order to have that truly um, understanding of how we are called to be practice that virtue simplicity. I think we're getting a uh, forcible practice of that right about now these days. Um, being able to pray more, like Francis de Sales, I think he did a spiritual communion, you mentioned that every 15 minutes because... You knew about the you know the the accidents being in us for about 15 minutes, and they did do it again. Uh, other saints would do it at the top of the hour. Um, his Eucharistic devotion. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yes, yes. So uh, Saint Francis de Sales, um, he really um, loved processions to the Blessed Sacrament. Of course, sometimes early on in his priesthood, uh, in the Calvinist areas, wasn't really possible to be so outward with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Uh-huh. Um, but um, in, in later years, when he could, he loved processions to the Blessed Sacrament. He also really encouraged priests to celebrate Mass every day, mm-hmm. um, uh, which wasn't always done at the time for, for various reasons. Um, and um, there's a beautiful chapter in the Spirit of St. Francis de Sales about that. Um, St. Francis de Sales really loved the mystery of the Incarnation, uh, God becoming man. Mm-hmm. And so he loved Christmas. He loved the Nativity of our Lord. That was his favorite feast. He said, you know, God comes down to be born in the stable of Bethlehem as a child to attract our hearts to love him. I mean, who can say no to a child? Uh, who can uh, 
Um, you know, God encourages us to love and have confidence in Him. In him. Mm -hmm. um, and so He wants to attract us to show how His divine truth is lovable for us. And so just as our Lord was born in the stable of Bethlehem as a young child in very humble circumstances, um, you know, very unpretentious, um, uh, while he is born on the stable, which is the altar, remember the word Bethlehem in Hebrew uh, means house of bread, mm -hmm. house of bread. So our Lord is born again upon our altar sacramentally in the Holy Eucharist uh, during the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Um, and so he considered the altar to be, the, you know, sort of the modern day manger, uh, manger of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. um, and even he was born, the, main, the word manger comes from you know, the French word manjoie, which is the place where it's a feeding trough for the animals. Mm -hmm. So our Lord being born in a feeding trough for animals really shows he is meant to be literally our spiritual food in the Holy Eucharist. So he would draw a lot of parallels between the birth of our Lord in Bethlehem and his birth sacramentally upon the altar. Our Lord becomes, um, you know, really, truly, substantially present there in the Holy Eucharist under the humble appearances of bread. Very humble, simple appearances. And if you look at that with the eyes of the world, well, you will easily look beyond, right? You'll, you know, it looks like nothing to, to someone with the eyes of the world. But with the eyes of faith, we know this is really, truly, substantially our Lord himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was a man of profound devotion to the incarnation. And thus, um, that really inspired his Eucharistic devotion. Yeah, think about when you said bread, it popped in my head about the uh, how our Lord used common things for the sacraments the water you can find it everywhere bread everywhere then make it as you mentioned simplicity it just made it simple it didn't make a you know i don't want to be sacrilegious or anything like that but he didn't make a you know a u.s prime steak to be it is something simple right right something that's easily available for all of us but um also so that he understands that really we're called to be um, simple humble instruments of god's providence um, for the people around us. When you look at throughout history, look at St. Joseph, mm -hmm. very humble carpenter, son of David. He was of the rightful ruling class of Judea, mm -hmm. St. Joseph was, but he was a very simple, humble carpenter. Um, look at our Blessed Mother, again, in her Magnificat, very simple, humble handmaid of the Lord. Um, throughout history, uh, God has used time and time again men and women who were very simple, very humble, but they were extremely, they were wiser than the, the than the and the smartest scholars, um, and they were more faithful um, as well uh, because um, you know they were really focused on God's will and not their own. Um, and so we were called to be humble instruments of God as well. Um, and uh, doesn't necessarily mean we have to do again big flamboyant actions. Mm -hmm. But Saint Francis de Sales says, "Be consistent. Be faithful in the little things. Be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, you know." Make, make good habits in the little things every day. Um, you know, try to plant a seed of faith in the people around you um, by a smile, a kind word, a positive communication. Maybe you can slip in a little, you know, God bless you. Uh, you know, happy Easter. We're still in the Easter season. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, you, you know, you're in my prayers during this difficult time. Um, we can also sometimes simply speak um, from our personal testimony. Um, you know, even if people don't have faith, even if they're even anti-faith, you can say, well, for me, faith really um, helps me to deal with these problems of life. Faith makes me more patient. Faith helps me um, to be grateful. I mean, you know, try to find little ways of planting a seed of faith in people around you, of being, of being, a, of being a missionary, really, bringing the truth in charity to others. And, you know, people won't always be convinced by, by arguments or by reasonings. No. Many times that kind of drives them away. But if you do it in an attractive manner, with kindness, with goodness, you're not self-seeking. You don't want something out of them. That's not why you're being kind to them. You're trying, if you do it in an attractive manner, in a gentle manner, then you can try to maybe bring them along, a little step by step, or you at least allow God the chance to, to work with them, grace to touch their hearts. So it's not by the mere human force we convert people, no. But it's by that force of, that sweet force of charity mm -hmm. by attracting them to the gentleness of, of who God is. Um, I guess that was always a big question with me with not just Francis, but like St. Anthony too. I mean, there's a story of him being invited in by a bishop and at the sermon, the opening line was, to you in the mitre, <laughs> and just called them out. 
Uh, and Francis de Sales in his writings, you read it and you're going, those words we couldn't use to, well, you, you, I don't know, maybe it's just our modern tone thinking of it. You're like, there's sometimes he'll say, they're pretend religion and things like that. I'm going, how, how do we, how do they do it? <laughs> yes. Well, um, you know, saints live in the context of their time. Mm -hmm. They live in the context of their time. And, you know, there's a Latin saying that, um, you know, saints are to be, uh, you know, admired and not always um, imitated. <laughs> that is, you know, we're not necessarily called to, you know, to do everything exactly like how the saints did because they lived in certain times. And, mm -hmm. but, but what we could do is, though, is we should be praying. We should be, um, uh, you know, we should receive a good Catholic education in, in spirituality, etc. Um, so then we can um, practice the virtue of prudence. Um, you know, we call St. Joseph the, um, you know, Joseph most prudent. How to apply, you know, the principles of our faith to individual circumstances every day. That's why we pray in the morning offering. Mm -hmm. St. Francis Sells has a great recipe for the morning offering in his introduction to the devout life. How you look over the coming day, you think about the people you're going to be meeting, um, the circumstances you're going to be in, and think ahead of time what you could say in the right way to make them think a little bit, to plant a seed of faith, but call them out a little bit, yes. <laughs> um, sometimes you need to do that. You know, but you need to do it in the right way, not in a passionate way that's about me. It's not about you being right. Mm -hmm. You know, if we if we force that too much, we might force people away from God and it will be our fault. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to answer for it one day. Yeah. So um, so there's a there's a time and a place for everything. We can't know always exactly how to do that. It's hard. But if we ask for wisdom, we ask for comfort, we receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost of Confirmation. If we pray to the Holy Ghost, we ask our, our Lady Seed of Wisdom, we pray to the saints like St. Saint Francis de Sales, St. Anthony, etc., and ask them by their prayers to, um, you know, to make us more aware of those gifts of the Holy Ghost within us and to put them into practice in the right way. Um, that's what we need to do on a daily basis. And then when I first started getting, I guess you said, zealous uh, on this and going out and doing St. Paul Street Team things, I remember reading on St. John Chrysostom talking about that you will be judged according to how many you ran off from the church going, ooh. <laughs> yes. That's a fine line. <laughs> well, it's true. You know, um, St. Francis also says that zeal, zeal is the ardor of charity. Uh -huh. Zeal is charity, but just kind of, you know, to an, to an exponential degree. And so really to show zeal, we need to show truly charity. And St. Paul talks in 2 Corinthians, what is charity? Charity is patient. Charity is kind. Charity does not seek its own. Charity is not puffed up. Um, charity, you know, sustains all and endures all, suffers all. So that goes back to we were talking about the virtue of fortitude. It's not just to go out and to attack. Um, fortitude is also staying in your ground, kind of like those, like those soldiers, crusading soldiers have to defend the fortress, stand their ground no matter what the enemy is throwing at them. You know, <laughs> think to the Lord of the Rings film and, you know, the soldiers defending the city of Gondor there. you got to stand your ground no matter what the devil throws at you, you know. Um, or Gandalf standing on the bridge when that, that big, in the first movie, when the, you know, the big uh, bell rower comes at him. He stands his ground. You shall not pass. We need to, you know, to be spiritually um, strong like that. Mm -hmm. But that comes from our Lord and not from us. It takes our cooperation with grace. Um, it takes frequent confession, frequent spiritual communion, you know, um, spiritual reading. Um, it takes implementing the humble things of life, the humble means that are given to us, that are accessible. Be consistent with those. Um, that is, um, that's the recipe for, for, for victory. I guess you could turn it also with the Saint Paul, uh, Saint Peter saying that he will die with our Lord at the Last Supper, and then being all puffed up, me, 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 and then when it happens, he's Oh, no, <laughs> I'm denying it yes. of some little peasant girl. <laughs> yes, yes, and, and that's our Lord showing us really who we should be and how we should live um, in the spiritual life. We have to, you know, learn from, we can learn from the saints' mistakes. You know, we can learn from St. Peter. Um, we can learn that, you know, the power of divine truth does not rest upon human quality, but upon God himself. Um, and so, um, yeah, St. Peter is lovable, isn't he? There's a... Uh, a great book by St. Peter, I really recommend by William Thomas Walsh called uh, Peter the Apostle. Okay. Um, and just to read um, how, you know, our Lord chose, I'm thinking of that because today we celebrate the Feast of Saints, uh, Soter and Caius, two holy Pope martyrs mm -hmm. um, who were successors of St. Peter. And, and really, 
um, you know, again, our, our Lord didn't choose this kind of, uh, you know, he didn't choose the Titanic. <laughs> he didn't choose the Titanic to be the boat of the church. No, he chose a simple little humble fisherman's boat. He didn't choose some kind of great general, some kind of great personality or president. He chose a humble fish, you know, fisherman. Mm -hmm. The Lord works with humble instruments. And, you know, all of us, we, we are called to be humble instruments. Um, so let's, you know, let's use our gifts, our talents, our qualities that are there. Thanks be to God for giving them to us. Let's use them, put them to good use. Um, and through prayer, through spirituality, through the sacraments, um, you know, we can grow and we can become those people that God wants us to be and that God is expecting that we be for his glory and the salvation of the souls around us. Why is St. Joseph uh, so important, not only to St. Francis de Sales, because I know you guys say a prayer by Francis de Sales to St. Joseph at the end of your Masses, but for everyone, the husbands, men in general, single, married, cleric? Yes. Yes, well, St. Joseph is such a wonderful model of, of so many virtues that we all need to practice. Look at St. Joseph's purity. You know, he was married. He was truly married, um, the saints tell us. He was truly married to our Blessed Mother. Um, you know, married the most beautiful um, a creature, um, really, ever to walk, uh, you know, um, um, you know, most beautiful woman ever to walk the face of this earth. Um, and yet he had such a profound reverence and, and, and a purity toward her. Um, you know, we see him put in, in predicaments that are very similar to what we have to do. Um, you know, we have... Uh, um, you know, he, um, you know, think about St. Joseph in, um, in Egypt. He's in a land of exile. He doesn't speak the language. Mm -hmm. And yet he has to be able to, to eke out a living so he can have bread to provide for his family. And he's a foreigner and he's looked down upon. He doesn't have the tools, doesn't know anybody. Um, we can find ourselves in so many situations like St. Joseph and, um, in, in our human life. Um, and really we pray um, that... Um, uh, you know, we, we pray that we will die a happy death. Mm -hmm. St. Joseph tradition tells us die, he died um, in the presence of Jesus and Mary, and they assisted him in his last hour. And so um, we pray to St. Joseph that we also will have a happy death with Jesus and Mary, having received the sacraments and the blessings of the church, will die with, um, you know, uh, with truly, um, you know, con contrite hearts. Um, and so we, we invoke St. Joseph every day for that, that grace of a happy death that we all wish to have. Um, and St. Joseph is, um, you know, I really recommend the Litany of St. Joseph, um, all those beautiful virtues, you know, Joseph most courageous, Joseph most prudent, Joseph most faithful. He was profoundly faithful day in and day out to what God asked of him. Um, you know, St. Joseph actually, St. Matthew says in a gospel how, um, you know, he had planned to, um, you know, to put Our Lady away quietly. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, St. Jerome tells us that he did that because he realized that something supernatural was taking place in Mary, his spouse. And he didn't feel worthy. Mm -hmm. he, knew that, he knew that she was a virtuous uh, a woman. Um, he knew her, her prayerful spirit. He knew that something profoundly supernatural was going to take place, and he didn't feel worthy to be part of it. That's why he wanted to just kind of fade into the background. But um, no, no, our Lord wanted to use him. And he, and when he understood that, he said, I'm here to serve. And he came forward. Didn't know how it was going to work out. He knew his own unworthiness, but he said, I'm, I'm here to serve. And St. Joseph is also the silent one. And don't we all have to learn sometimes to keep our mouth shut, right? <laughs> to be more silent, to use more, um, more, more care in what we say or what we don't say. Yeah. Um, you know, more that we, we use words of charity and, and goodness, um, edifying words. Um, and sometimes we learn um, also, um, you know, uh, we want to be careful sins of omission. We don't want to keep silent when we really have to speak up. Mm -hmm. So we need to ask St. Joseph to really um, have that sense of silence, but that sense of, um, of using our, our speech to, to glorify God, again, to be, uh, you know, to edify souls. Um, St. Joseph is a great, um, he's also, um, you know, he must have been a man of great prayer. I mean, he lives in Jesus' presence you know, all there in the, in the workshop. Uh, I'm sure he must have had a, he lived in the presence of God. And he was conscious of that because he was a man of faith. Yeah. So we can also ask St. Joel to help us to imitate that that presence of God, that awareness of the presence of God in his life like he, uh, like he did, that, that we also have that same prayerful spirit as well. Yeah, I, I you know, can't imagine. <laughs> oh yeah, there's my, <laughs> there's God right there. <laughs> yes. How you tell me you built the chair wrong? 
Yes, it must have been hard for St. Joseph because, you know, Mary was immaculate and, of course, our Lord himself, you know, God himself there. But he was a sinful man. And, you know, he had passions and he had, he had weaknesses too, limitations. But he accepted them. Um, and he was repentant of them. He always tried to, you know, uh, to become a better man. Um, he was faithfully consistent um, toward making spiritual progress. Um, so, um, that's, that's good you brought that up to you because he was third on the totem pole basically in holiness but he was the leader of the family mm -hmm. yes right exactly exactly and again because you know um, he was given that authority by God and so those of us who received authority it does not belong to us it belongs to God and one day we'll answer for it before God in judgment mm -hmm. um, so we have to use that authority um, in a Christ-like way in a God-like way um, and you know that means not abusing it but also not allowing it to be eclipsed by, um, you know, because of fear or because of of whatever, you know, there's, um, you know, uh, those those virtues, you know, we have to be careful of excesses, but also of deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have to ask God every day through the intercession of Saint Joseph, our Blessed Mother, how how do we, how can we really, you know, use that God-given authority to serve, to serve others, to bring them closer to God, um, and. That should be our daily prayer to St. Joseph. Just so I don't leave the women out of this, how can they become more like Mary as she was the Immaculate Conception and holiness again, she was above St. Joseph, but she obeyed St. Joseph. She could have said, hey, you know, I'm the Immaculate Conception. We ain't going anywhere or anything like, you know, when they say go, we're going to Egypt. Um, how does, how what's, practic what's a practical way for wives and to be able to, as you, you know, maybe not bust out at the husband as much or, or you know, give them the honor that they deserve, things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I'm, prayer is the key. Um, the more we pray, the more we, um, uh, you know, the more we try to imitate Mary, um, then uh, the more we pray, the more our hearts want to imitate Mary. And, you know, and, and I think that that's, um, that's where it starts. That's where it starts uh, with prayer. Um, I think also at the same time, um, really to uh, to be encouraging, you know, wives to, to encourage husbands to, uh, you know, uh, to, um, you know, I mean, wives know their husbands very well. Um, and so I think to, um, um, you know, th through prayer, again, a wisdom, a counsel comes to us um, that um, is very helpful, um, in, you know, in any marriage. Uh, so uh, that's... Um, that's, that's, that should really be a subject of our meditation, Mary, Mary and Joseph. There, it was a true marriage. Of course, they were, they, they were, you know, they, they both lived as, as virgins. But how, um, how can we imitate their marriage in our life? That, that'd be, a, that'd be a subject of a good conference. Yes, 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 it would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Colonel Burke did one six years ago that uh, from his uh, Wisconsin, in his Wisconsin group. But uh, could always do another one. <laughs> yes. Well, Canon, uh, wrapping it up, what are some final words and maybe uh, where they can, uh, the website? I have the website underneath, but uh, anyways, what can people help with, uh, funds, donations, seminarian help, uh, things like that? Well, thank, thank you, Steve, for that opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, so um, our website, institute-christ-king.org. Um, the Institute's also present on, you know, various social media platforms, uh, you know, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, Facebook. Um, we really encourage people to, um, you know, to, uh, to tap into our live stream liturgies. Um, it's called, we're calling it uh, DeSales Studio, St. Francis DeSales being a patron of communications. Um, and so we have a daily mass, um, you know, with, uh, with sermons as well. But also um, we want to bring people the divine office, uh, you know, Vespers, a Compline is available on most nights. So check it out at institute-christ-king.org. That the link on the home page will take you to that page with the resources you can follow along as well. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, uh, God's blessed us with many vocations. We have about about um, eighty five seminarians. Thanks be to God, they're all healthy and well. They're quarantined there at our seminary um, in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, no one goes in, no one goes out. And so they've been they they've been healthy there in Italy. Um, and uh, and you know more and more men um, really are looking for a priestly vocation. Um, here, I, I, I personally receive a lot, you know all of those inquiries, and I follow up with the men. And more men are interested in making visits, get, 
you know, need to know, uh, they all want the traditional liturgy, mm -hmm. and they all want some sort of community life. They're afraid of being priests on their own one day. They want to live in community, to pray together. Um, so, um, you know, we're very grateful for any donations uh, that really help help us to provide the seminarians with all the all um, all the formation that they need, uh, the education, the professors, the books, um, the room and board. Um, so any donations to our website, we really appreciate that. Um, there's also women are looking for um, they're looking for um, you know to serve Christ and, and religious life and the Sisters of Doros. Uh, the Sisters of Doors of the Royal Heart of Jesus, the feminine branch of the Institute. There's information on our website about them as well. If you want to help support uh, uh, postulants, um, you know, there's, a, there's about um, uh, probably about 50, 50 sisters now. Um, and uh, I would say at least a quarter to a third of them are from the United States. Um, and there's uh, always more interest among, among American women as well. Um, and we just made our first foundation of the sisters uh, last fall in, uh, at St. Mary's Oratory in, in Wausau, Wisconsin, central Wisconsin, in the diocese where Cardinal Burke welcomed us in the Institute, uh, Diocese of the Cross, back in, in 1995. Um, so if people want to donate to the sisters as well. Um, you know, they can do so online. Um, and simply the Institute, you know, we're growing in the United States, we're serving 18 dioceses. Um, <laughs> I have another phone call with... Uh, with the bishop later today, who just contacted yesterday, say, you know, can we have a conversation? There's a lot of interest, there's a lot of, of needs out there, mm -hmm. um, but we need help to really keep growing the United States through our provincial headquarters. So anyone that can help us to continue our, our you know, this growth, you know, nationally through, um, you know, bolstering and supporting, donating to our to our provincial headquarters, would be very helpful for us as well to keep up with all this demand on the vocations and on the apostolates, and then, and to serve this whole family as well. Um, so donating to our provincial headquarters is, is much appreciated as well. Because one of your cares is, is missionary work, right? Well, we want to be outgoing. We are a family of prayer around the altar. So the canons are priests who pray the divine office around the altar. We pray morning, at midday if we can, and in the evening mm -hmm. together. But then to go from the altar out into the world and to, and to you know, bring the sacraments to the sick, uh, to pray uh, on the streets in front of abortion mills, uh, to eat dinner in family homes and bless the family home and to you know talk to families on a kind of an individual basis. We want to go out to meet people where they are in that missionary spirit, but always to bring them back to the altar, from the altar to people, and then to bring people to the altar. That's our goal. That's our goal always to bring people to Christ, bring them to the to the liturgy. Um, sometimes some people have a long way to go, but let's try to bring them one step one step at a time. So um, again, that's the idea of canon secular. Um, praying at the altar, going out to meet people, and then to bring people to the altar, the sacraments, to the liturgy. Fishing for them, right? Christ. Right, right. Well, Ken, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being on. And uh, before you go, can you get a blessing? Yes. May the Lord grant you health of body, mind, and soul. May he grant you strength in all of your difficulties, patience in all of your trials. May he grant you joy in doing this holy oath each and every day to the intercession of Blessed Mary of the Virgin, the Immaculate Conception, to the intercession of St. Joseph, patron of the Universal Church and patron of family life, and to the intercession of St. Francis de Sales. May Almighty God bless you. Benedictio de Omnipotentis, Patris et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti, de Shenat Super Vos, et Mani et Semper. Amen. Thank you.